Welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all today, and especially to talk about one of my favorite subjects that most other doctors have no idea what I'm talking about and don't even want to go there, is fascia and connective tissue. And it's just really fun to have somebody who has made it their life's work to help us move our fascia and connective tissue. So, you know, and Deanna Hansen is a really, I guess, a pioneer in this because too many people have uh, just patted us to move our fascia. And I think Deanna is onto something really special. So I think the most important thing and what I'm really looking forward to listening to from Deanna is what is fascia and why should we really care about it so much? Well, Dr. Gordon, Eric, as you'd prefer to be called, um, <laughs> that's a fantastic question. And I get asked that all the time. And it's really fascinating because I think there's a lot of differing views about this phenomenal system that literally contains every one of our trillions of cells. So like skin to the body, fascia is the skin to the cell. Each of these cells are interconnected through this beautiful system of communication. It creates both mobility and stability for the body but we need to look after the fascia system in order for it to really be working for us on our behalf. So ultimately, the goal is that we keep every one of these trillions of cells in their rightful position. If that's the case, there's optimal space. And space is important because space allows ease of flow. So when we have space in and around every one of these cells, there's ease of absorption of nutrients into the cell, as well as toxins taken away from the cell. And if that's the case, then our bodies function. There's really no need for pain signals. There's no congestion or toxic environments because the body is really efficient at pulling in, taking what it needs and releasing what it doesn't. So that in a nutshell is really what the fascia system is all about. It's this beautiful extracellular network connecting every single cell in the body. Yeah. But I think it it, it what we see is that how much when fascia loses its um, its smoothness or it, it just gets sticky. And so, I mean, and that's, um, you know, just how to say, I, I just want to like put what, what's so important to me, why I care so much about fascia is because when people have chronic inflammation, they're stuck, they're not draining. And um, their muscular movements aren't smooth anymore. And just even as we age, the muscular movements aren't smooth anymore. So when and, and so when I think of fascia, I'm always thinking of of its its function on muscles and holding the organs. But you've added a new component to that. How it really is every part of the body is involved. So um, what what brought you to that realization? I mean, what what how did you really deep make such a deep dive into the world of fascia and connective tissue? It was through my own personal exploration. So back, I'm, I'm 54 now, back in my 20s, I had certified as an athletic therapist here in Canada. And my practice was always focusing on deep tissue work. And I had a really good practice because I had good strong hands and I was able to find that scar tissue and break it up, typically working on people's backs and legs. But my own personal body was not in a good place, even though I was applying what I had learned. I was eating what I believed was good, healthy food. I was exercising as I was trained as an athletic therapist, but the harder that I worked, the bigger I became. I was 50 pounds overweight, struggling with anxiety, depression, chronic pain. So at the age of 30, I made some big changes in my life. And this one, well, this, <laughs> these changes created severe anxiety attacks. This one anxiety attack in particular was the seed of everything to come because in that moment, I actually thought I was going to die. I was literally, literally frozen in fear. For some reason, I intuitively dove my hand into my abdomen. This was really the moment that all of this began because in that moment, I encountered pain. Now, I had carried my 50 pounds of extra weight primarily in my core, so I really hated this space in my body. I never touched it. So now here I am diving my hand deep into this tissue, but once I encountered that pain, it brought me out of my anxiety mode. It brought me back to the ground. So I, I recognized I was breathing and I was going to be okay. And because I was so fascinated by that sensation, I continued with my hands to explore in that tissue. And what I experienced under my fingertips was this marbling 
of what felt like scar tissue, even though I hadn't had any injury or surgery in that space. So suddenly I had all these aha moments, like no wonder when I'm coming back from a five mile run, dripping wet with sweat, my belly would still feel cold. So after the first evening of spending 30, 45 minutes in that space and feeling really, really calm, I woke up the next day a little bit tender, but I was calm all day and I had patience all day. And I was just really excited to get back and to continue this exploration. So after the second evening of doing that same work, when I stood up, I felt taller. And when I looked at myself in the mirror, I literally began to cry because my belly looked flatter than it had looked in years, years of all of the exercise, 400 sit-ups a day. I mean, like everything that I was doing, I know now was the incorrect approach to creating a healthy size and shape. However, that was what I was trained to do, work really hard and, and decrease your caloric intake, but none of that worked for me. So now here I am after literally only two days of spending time in this space, and I already see changes. So every night I would come home from work and I would continue this exploration. And within two weeks, my chronic low back pain was going away. My depression was lifting. Everything was changing. So at that time, I started flipping my patients onto their backs and I started working intuitively in their tissue in the same manner that I was doing what I was doing. And I had amazing results. And shortly after that, I started attracting therapists because word was getting out about what I was doing and the results I was having. And that was 24 years ago. And, and that began the journey of really understanding this tissue. So first spending countless hours in my own body and then applying what I was learning to my patients. Wow. Wow. That, that is, I mean, it's an amazing story of personal exploration, but more important to, for all of us is that it's a teaching for how much depends on flow in the body. When you cut off flow, especially in the abdomen and, you know, you were super healthy and this was happening to you, you know, and so that's why it's so important for people to understand who have, um, you know, who have illnesses for other reasons and their body is beginning to rebel and all the, the fear that gets locked in the system. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we meditate and we do all kinds of things to help, but um, I always have felt that it's the body that is carrying these, um, it, it's not even emotion. I mean, emotions, it's not ideas. I always hate to use like psychological words because people start making pictures and I think it's best to just experience and, and, and not, not decide what's there, you know? So a, as you work through the connective tissue, um, you know, how do you find it linking up to how the organs function? Oh, that's a great question, Eric. Thank you for asking that. So with the fact that fascia innervates every single cell in the body, it innervates the organs, the muscles, ligaments, tendons, absolutely everything, even the bone. So what we need to understand is how time impacts us. So we are under the influence of gravity constantly. Gravity is pulling us down toward the earth. Combine that with the fact that we are dominant on one side. We're not conscious breathers probably. Most people aren't really aware of how to use the body in a balanced, symmetrical way. And then add in stress, stress in relationships, all the other things. Basically our fascia is this big sponge absorbing everything. So as we go through time, we become shorter and wider. We decrease in our internal space. And as we do that, we start literally winding down toward the earth. And what's happening is the cells are getting drawn away from that correct alignment. And the body is here to keep us balanced and aligned. So as soon as that starts happening, the first thing that happens is we get a pain signal because basically pain is the baby. It's like the baby crying. It's the language of the cell. So it's giving us a little bit of a prompt to say, hey, mom or dad, you've asked me to do this incredible job of allowing you to thrive, but you're not paying attention to me. And now you're squishing me. So it lets you know through a pain shot, but because we don't understand the value of this language of pain, we might mask it or we posturally avoid it. And then it continues to manifest further and further because gravity keeps pulling us down. So the thing about gravity, it grips onto density, dense tissue. So scar tissue created from injury or surgery, that's dense tissue. Compression over time creates dense tissue because adhesions develop. So adhesions are really important to understand because as we start falling away from balance, the fascia in its beautiful design here to support us 
almost like a spider web. It shoots out this web of adhesion hooking onto anything in its path, including bone, to try to stop us from tipping over. Because if we allow the body to just continue on that negative pathway from unconscious awareness, we would literally fall off our feet. So there's always these counterbalances happening in the body. The fascia literally creates false walls and false floors. But this is essentially what scar tissue is. It blocks blood and oxygen flow to cells. So now we've got the body developing all of these issues because we can't get flow to cells on the other side for proper function. So again, it's all about understanding that pain signal and knowing what to do to bring those cells back into correct alignment. So the adhesions and the scar tissue, in my view, are really the biggest things in the body that we need to understand and address to allow ourselves to regain that balance and symmetry that we've lost through time under these external forces. Yeah, no, that's that it's it's what I love about your explanation, your story is that it's it's you're tell, telling the same story that I like to tell, but in different words. I think uh, you know, I come from that when people have um a part of the body that hurts and you don't complete healing. You know, because we injure ourselves day in and day out, but usually the body's pretty good. It heals itself. Um, but when it doesn't get to finish completely and it keeps making that noise, you know, if the noise, well, we start to ignore it and the nervous system starts to ignore it. And so then there's less blood flow to that area. And then, and, you know, and, but it, it's interesting how, you know, we're, it's the same story. We're just looking at it from a slightly different angle, you know, because it, it happens at the end of the day, you have a part of the body that is not getting good drainage and, you know, and, and then we get into trouble. And so what, what excited me when I, when I read your book was thinking about um, how it affects the internal organs, because most of us, I mean, when I send people for um, different types of body work. I'm usually trying to get them to open up flow in a general sense to, you know, we just let the diaphragm work better. But you had examples of how it was affecting, you know, the heart and the liver at levels that I didn't think I really was aware that of the possibilities being that grand. <laughs> and I'd love to show you here what, what I was referring to with the compression. So yeah. when we're properly aligned, we have this muscle this diaphragm that moves up and down in the body but when we're not conscious breathers this muscle becomes weak and then this happens so we literally the weight of the rib cage and everything above it causes us to collapse into that abdominal space so then everything has to be adjusted because there's no more room in the abdomen once we fall into that space so now we have a displacement of organs when that diaphragm is working properly, it also is creating a beautiful massage-like effect to those organs. So it's heating everything. But when we don't properly breathe, we start breathing through the muscles of the upper chest, that becomes weak and it becomes frozen. So now we're not getting any activity in that space, which is required for all functions in the body. For example, digestion. The diaphragm is the muscle right above the abdominal organs. And when it's working properly, it's creating energy and heat. So when we're eating, part of what allows us to digest properly is that action happening, but people don't do that. So when we're breathing through the muscles up here and we're collapsed into that space, now we've got the stomach organ that's squished and there's no activity to aid in digestion. So the stomach has to work extra hard to even try to break down that food and Often we're not even chewing properly. So we're swallowing whole food into this space that's actually now a cold container and the body just doesn't have the energy to do anything properly. And this is, in my opinion, why we're seeing so many people riddled with gut issues. Yeah. You know, talk a little bit more about how you see the diaphragm, um, you know, really creating, you know, creating the heat, create, letting the mitochondria throughout the system work. So when we are breathing properly, this muscle with the inhale moves down, it's a plate. And when we exhale, it moves up. So when we're breathing correctly, 24 seven, we have this going on. The challenge is pain, fear, and stress cause us to reactively hold the breath. So today <laughs> it's pretty much stressful all the time. Most people are in adrenal 
overload, they're exhausted, chronic fatigue, we're, we're literally stressed all the time. So most people are really breathing through the muscles of the upper chest is the secondary muscles. The diaphragm is the body's furnace or the body's major motor, the muscles of the upper chest being the secondary muscles for breathing. They're more like a space heater or think of a trolling motor in a boat. In a boat. It doesn't have that same ability to heat the body. And the reason it's so important to breathe diaphragmatically, because it's at the base of the lungs where the majority of the oxygen receptor sites reside, the alveoli. So upper chest breath, which tends to be shallow, we're not pulling the air deeply enough into the lungs for optimal absorption. And in Stephen Cope's book, Yoga and the Quest for the True Self, he mentions that we can feed the body up to six times, 600% more oxygen through diaphragmatic breathing. And every single cell, first and foremost, needs oxygen to thrive. If we're, if, if we're uh, lacking oxygen for five minutes, our brain will die. And every cell is like a, a, little, a little mini brain. So as we go through time with this impaired breath, we are literally, literally shutting down these cells. And they simply don't have that energy to do the job that they're supposed to do. And then also they shared in 2014, they did a study in the medical news proving that 84% of weight loss comes through proper exhalation because of the detoxification that comes through that ability to expel the air fully and properly from the body. So again, if we're breathing through the upper chest, mouth breathing, we're simply blocking the body's ability to properly feed and properly clean itself. And Long term, this is really what has devastating effects on our health. It's also, though, how we experience what we believe is normal aging. And in my view, we don't have to age the way that we've been conditioned to believe that we are aging. We we actually have far more control in the body to change the game um, through understanding proper diaphragmatic breathing. Yeah. Well, you know, it, again, it, it's just like. Looking at looking at from all the different perspectives, yeah, you know, how important breathing is for uh, to allow detox. Because if you if you're not having that diaphragmatic breathing, your liver isn't getting pumped. You're not massaging. You know, I mean that that's the thing. And you you can do work with your hands, but just if you're breathing correctly, you're always moving that liver. Because this is the, the issue that my that I know doctors have, and I, th I think a lot of patients also, is we, we, st we start off with a rather static view of the body. We see organs as kind of um, just sitting there, not moving. You know, we don't realize that everything inside of us is moving. And when it's not, when it's not moving well, it's not functioning well. And I, I, I think that is what's so critical about the work that you're doing is you're beginning to get movement back. So, and I, I said, I've had the pleasure of, of, you know, playing with some of your, I always call everything playing, except to part, um, playing with um, using some of your tools. And so, you know, tell me, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how your approach to treating, you know, how people can begin to change their bodies a bit, because I'm going to go back at the end and sure during questions, talk a lot about the kind of physiology and science and just how I look at it and how you look at it, but just some of the practical things, you know, how do you begin to get people to start to move um, the body and get the fascia more alive again? That's a great question. So basically, um, as we talked before, gravity compresses us. So we want to decompress the fascia. That's the key. And there's three pillars to really make this system really available and optimal for people, yet it's simple to do. So when, I'm sorry, can you ask me that question again? I just <laughs> got lost in my head. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I love that. Fascia decompression. How does it I work? I do that all the time. And like, oh. It's what happens when you're, when I, you know, Mine's a beautiful place, lots of rooms. <laughs> um, so, you know, really how I just, cause I, I we're gonna be talking a lot about moving the fascia, but, yes. but you, you know, the your program is on one hand, so seems so simple, but I can tell you from doing it, it it's so profound in how it affects your body. So just what, do you, how, how do you start it? I mean, like what, what did, how is it, how does it work? <laughs> so the very first thing that we wanna do is we want to, access 
this diaphragm muscle. So fascia will grip and adhere to bone with a force of 2000 pounds per square inch. So if we've been sitting this way for 10, 20, 30 years, sitting in front of the computer, our diaphragm has lit literally been folded over and locked away, kind of like a frozen shoulder. So the very first thing that we wanna do is we wanna access this space and create a release and a lift to be able to open up this space and access more of this phenomenal muscle. And that comes through pressure over time. So with fascia decompression, we can use a tool. We use locks made of wood or bamboo. The reason we use that medium is because we need to get to the bone and wood and bone are similar in density. If we use something that's porous, it's not going to go through the layers. It's going to stay on the surface. And we need to drive through the layers of fascia all the way to the bone, because that's where the fascia is rooted. And it's really magnetically sealing us in this negative space. So by doing this process, we spend a minimum, a minimum of three minutes in each position that we instruct you to create a melting of those adhesions through the layers. We also teach you how to very slowly move through the layers using pain as your guide because pain is what took us away from correct alignment. So we have this very specific roadmap to take us back to correct alignment when we learn the value of pain. And what's lovely is the pressure fibers are larger in the pain than the pain fibers. So once you connect in, those pressure fibers start to respond and the sensation changes. And you're also in control of the amount of pressure. And the rule is your breath is your guide. So the first pillar is creating space through the actual process of lying on the tool and moving through those layers. The second one is inflating that space through teaching proper diaphragmatic breathing. And that's the key. The magic is, is the, the both of them because with that diaphragm working properly, we are, in, we are heating the internal body. And when you combine that with adding pressure on the outside of the body for three minutes where we're improving circulation, those two very effectively connect together and create that melting of adhesions all the way to the root. It's a process. And, and I mean, we're all starting with our body at whatever time and place and situation that we're starting from. But what's lovely is because the diaphragm, as soon as we start opening it up and we start activating that action, right away we are absorbing so much more oxygen and we are releasing so many more toxins. And if you think of blowing up a balloon, when that balloon is fully blown up, it almost defies gravity. It's nice and round and smooth. But if you let half of the air out of the balloon, it becomes wrinkled, dirt and debris get stuck in the creases and it becomes heavy and dense. So as soon as we turn on that beautiful muscle, we start to oxygenate the body more. Those cells, they're hungry for life. So they start taking that oxygen in and things start changing really fast. And right away you get a sense of, I can sit up taller with greater ease. So we always start in that space of the body because we want to turn on that muscle and teach you how to fully activate it so that we can, again, start absorbing that much more oxygen. And then from there, we approach the foundation of the body and then we get up into the head and the neck because there's cause sites to the pain. So if we're only working where we have pain or where we think we have an issue, we are going to be not as efficient at getting to the root of the issue because over time, the fascia is constantly adapting to what happens to our body. Again, we're, we're like sponges and then we have injury and we have insults and, and potentially surgeries. All of these things add up in the system and it creates this tight, bound, sticky container for the cells which again, the body is like so amazing with inflammation because as soon as the cells are not getting what they need, the body's going to direct blood flow or inflammation to those areas. But if there's blockages all along the way, then we just become backed up and stagnant. The inflammation's not moving. It becomes acidic. And then we attract other things. And then we're caught in this crazy space of what do we do to get out of this issue? So turning that breath on right away is the key. So those first two pillars are really the basis for melting those adhesions and getting blood and oxygen flow into that newly created space. And then the third pillar is teaching proper postural foundations, because we don't want to continue 
to fall in to those spaces, which is really, in my view, what's causing the challenges for the most part in the first place. So we teach people how to support proper alignment. And there's three pillars to the body. There's the foundation, we call it rooting. We're like a building. We want to make sure that, again, we're structurally supporting ourselves because if we're not, Again, the fascia is going to develop false walls and false floors, and they are barricades to flow. The second pillar is the diaphragm. So simply the act of working it helps to keep that foundation aligned. And then the third one is the tongue muscle, which is actually in part designed to help support the weight of the head. It's not just for chewing and talking. It's this very strong, powerful muscle that has a specific alignment that is designed to support correct alignment. So when you combine all three of these components together, you have a very effective and simple protocol to start moving all of that stagnant inflammation out of the body and to start supporting um, health in your cells. Yeah. What, what, I, what I love is that you can start simply, okay? Because, you know, what a lot of, I said, our patients by and large are people who um, have reached that point where inflammation from an outside source often, you know, whether it be a toxin or an infection, has now gotten into one of those areas of restriction, because that, that's something that we see a lot, you know, like if people, Lyme is the great example of, you know, um, you know, why does one person get, you know, their neck, another person, their mid back, another person is their knee, you know, it's often because those are areas that were stressed beforehand, and the blood flow wasn't as good, and the drainage wasn't as good. So it's a place where the immune system isn't working as well. And I said, the nervous system isn't paying as much attention and bugs can wind up staying there uh, and, and causing problems. And so, and when that, when that situation has wound around for a few years or sometimes decades, um, it, it's, it feels sometimes hopeless. And where do we, how do we start? And I, you know, when, when you, but I love when you start with simple things that almost everyone can do. I said, and I say, you know, as we've talked before, um, you have videos that show, you know, how not to start with the blocks. If you have a lot of, if your system, if your nervous system is really stuck in sympathetic overdrive and every stimulus sets you off, well, start, start much gentler and you go into that in, in very nice detail. But the, an intriguing thing is the tongue muscle that you talk about, because people don't realize how important that is and how many of our, and again, um, this obstructive sleep apnea, we see it in all these thin people and it's their tongue falling back or not staying where it belongs. And, and just, so if you just talk, I mean, cause that's an area that I think people just don't think about and aren't aware of how important that is. So, cause most of us have a good idea that we should be breathing with our diaphragm or at least some of the time, but the tongue I don't think people think about much. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes. And just focusing on the tongue will never be enough because we are driven down toward the earth from the areas of fascia that are the most frozen. So the calves and the feet, the forearms and the hand, they're the furthest from the engine. So as we fall out of alignment, the limbs are always acting as these counter balancers. And then the fascia grips and adheres and locks us in that space. So one of the things we need to do is we need to really support proper rib cage alignment because that's the foundation for the head and the neck. So from here, now what we want to do is if you notice at the roof of the mouth, about a pinky nail distance from your teeth, there's a ridge. And notice how the tongue naturally docks into that ridge. So the surface of the tongue should be supporting the roof of the mouth. Imagine having an almond in your mouth and you're wanting to hold the almond up against the roof of the tongue. When I'm not conscious of where my tongue position is, it moves forward and to the right. And then I end up clenching more on the left side of my jaw. When I pull that tongue back into correct alignment, then we've got balance and symmetry in the mouth. And also people that have what they think is a double chin, it's actually a displaced weak tongue. So when that tongue isn't nice and strong and the rib cage is in the line, everything gets pulled forward. And then if that tongue is weak, we are blocking the carotid arteries. We are negatively affecting the thyroid, the major lymphatic drainage sites. And then of course, everything up through here isn't getting proper flow because when these are blocked, you're not getting that proper blood flow to your brain or your eyes or your hair, or your skin, all of these things. So that's the beautiful thing about the fascia is when we understand how to support 
the alignment of the cells, whether we're talking about how we feel, how we function, how we look, how we age, our size and shape, how to maintain that, it's all the same information that's necessary to address because it all comes down to keeping those cells aligned so there's optimal space. And as long as there's optimal space, there's flow. So that was a little bit of a drawn out answer to your no, tongue question. No, <laughs> that, that was the answer I wanted because it, it's, it's flow is the issue. I mean, you know, so many people are worried. I mean, well, either they're worried about um, getting cognitive issues or they have cognitive issues because of, of chronic infections where they're, you know, brain fog. And, and it's the lymphatic drainage that's needed. And, and these lymphatics have are such low pressure systems that anything that impedes flow, that's the first place to go. And, and when that goes, it just makes it, harder to have a, a mind that's clear okay so i mean and and using the tongue uh, or people being aware of the tongue and starting to pay attention to it is huge but but it all goes along as you say unfortunately if gravity is always giving you a funky signal you're going to be in trouble i mean that's it, it, it's we yeah, we, we don't realize how important gravity is. And that's a whole other webinar <laughs> for another, another day. But um, it, it, is, it is that force that's constantly on our body and we're constantly reacting to. And if you don't know where you are in space, you're always going to be a little off. And um, boy, oh, what a mess that can make. So, but, but getting back to if we can get you know, our, our bodies reasonably aligned. And, and I just want to emphasize that too. People sometimes, we don't have to be perfect. OK, just for those of you out there, I want to emphasize that, you know, when you look in the mirror, a lot of us have, you know, one shoulder a little higher than the other. And, you know, it would be really nice when all this is aligned. Um, but we can still, as we work through the process, any little bit helps. Perfection is not needed here. <laughs> no. And I always share with people, this isn't about going from A to Z. This is right. about being on the right path. And yeah. that's the beautiful part, because just every single step along the way it gives you gifts and benefits. I'm 24 years into this process. And what I love about it so much, back in my 20s, when I was a total mess in my body and my mind and everything, I've changed so much in that period of time. But what's so lovely is the changes continue. We're never going to be at that end point of perfection because we are always under these forces and we're not always going to be conscious 100% of the time. I don't think that's possible. Nor, nor is it even maybe the goal. I mean, who wants to be perfect? Like, <laughs> what, what's the fun in that, right? But to know that we're taking the steps in that direction is really where the value comes from because then you feel like you have control of your health. You're empowered to know what to do. And that, in my view, is one of the be most beautiful gifts is understanding the language of your cell. And as we go through those layers and melt through those adhesions, what's actually happening is we are connecting consciously to the cells that were blocked from our consciousness. So we're awakening to those deeper messages. I love in Greg Braden's book, in one of his books, um, The God Code, he goes into total detail, which I'm not very good with detail, but he basically shared that they found that on the surface layer of every cell is the message God lies within. So when we're actually connected to those cells, then we have that ability to bring forward what we're supposed to be doing here. And so many of us, because of those adhesions, those adhesions block the ability for us to be connected. Some partially, but when they're really, really bad, there's a disassociation. And that's where I think a lot of people from trauma really get trapped and stuck. Because again, when we have pain, fear, or stress, we reactively hold the breath. And if we don't release that patterning from that moment, then we continue onward from that negative breath. And then we really diminish the amount of oxygen we're sending to those cells because the diaphragm simply isn't working and we're not absorbing enough. So then they become shut off. And now we might only have 10, 20, 30% of our cells really doing the communication for how we live our body. And that causes us to rely on memory because we need our cells to communicate, all of them to communicate, to be living in the moment and, and to be able to really see each moment as a unique expression where when we're really blocked, we get caught in these patterns of behavior of memory. So um, I, just a great example. Um, I, I learned this when I started the practice of yoga. I was actually studying to become an Iron Bar yoga teacher. 
and we had to do a lot of self-reflection. So um, as I was going through this journey, I was walking through a mall and I was in a great mood. And this gentleman passes me and we lock eyes for a brief moment and he scowls at me. And in that moment, my gut turned and suddenly like I just felt stressed because his glance reminded me of how my dad would look at me when he was disappointed. But because I was in this moment of self-discovery, I recognized that we might have just looked at each other at a moment we had a, when he had a shot of pain in his knee or something and he scowled because he was in pain. And I'm thinking this is about me. I don't know this person. We were just walking by each other. So as soon as I recognized that, I thought, okay, this isn't about me. I'm not going to take that on because had I taken that on, that would have changed the entire course of my day. I might have gone home and I might have been you know, unkind to my family because I was feeling so distraught inside from something that wasn't even about me, possibly. And maybe it was about me, but who cares? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that's one of the, you know, you, you just laid out a whole bunch of important things about healing. And I think right there, one of the big ones is, tut, is um, you know, um, don't, don't, uh, don't imagine enemies, you know, don't, don't make problems for yourself. It, it's, and that is our, our nature, especially when our body is not able to be fluid and we're stuck in space, meaning home. <laughs> and it's easy for rumination, you know, thinking over and over again, things. And it, it's, it, that's that process. It happens. I mean, on all levels. And that's why healing can, you know, people can heal with whatever modality sings to them. You know, it's not, you don't have to do it one way. Uh, I don't, my only putting a point out is that if you're working on the modality that you're in love with and it's not working, look someplace where you might not be so comfortable. Okay. Because sometimes we're lucky. We fall in love with the modality that's going to allow us to heal. That is also the one that we want to have. <laughs> but many times what we need is not always exactly what that mind, which is layered on top of stories of what really is going on and going, and the body is really in touch because it of just it, it knows what is because it is what is, you know, our frontal cortex is what can be, what may have been, what we'd wanted to. It's all full of story and it's brilliant and they're wonderful, but healing is at a deeper level. And if we can access that, you know, by letting go of the mind through meditation, that's great. But some of us don't do that well. Through the body is always, the, I think, the most honest way in because it's been said many times, the body doesn't lie. It's just there for you. And you're and using um, the kind of teachings that you have in your program is just that you get a chance to meet your body. And that that's beautifully put. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hello. And it <laughs> talks to you. It makes noise. And it, I mean, I, it, 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 but you can, you know, but the point is, is that you're in control. It doesn't, what's so nice about this is that you don't have to worry that someone else is going to overtreat you. You know, you can't overtreat yourself, but well, take the responsibility and don't do that again. <laughs> so, yes. And, and during the process, we always teach you your breath is your guide. As long as you're breathing in a relaxed way, you're feeding and healing that tissue. If something hurts so much that you're, you know, you're panicking and it's taking that relaxed breath away, that's your body saying, no, we're not ready for that. We need to back off. So through the instruction, you're always given that awareness that it really does come down to your breath. And there needs to be that comfort, that parasympathetic nervous system. This is a rest and digest form of practice. And that's the beautiful piece because we're all in sympathetic overload, I believe, and we need to find that balance between the two. And as soon as we connect in to that full exhalation, that diaphragmatic breathing with pressure, and it, it feels lovely. It's, it's like your cells are getting a hug because again, we've got the bone and we've got the wood meeting each other through this process and it's all slow. There's nothing forceful or jarring it's all slow and controlled and you're just simply following that path of pain. And, and then what's so lovely is you feel that pain dissipate. And then we instruct you now twist a little bit and go find some more pain. And it's so empowering when you sense the pain changing. And then when you get up and suddenly, wow, 
I've got so much more range of motion in my shoulder because I was working in this space. And all I was really doing was lying there breathing. And, and then it's like, holy smokes, this is fast. It, the, the effects are, are really fast and profound. Again, everybody, every body is different in when they're starting this and how they're approaching it. But it, it really is a simple, beautiful approach where you are the one dealing with your own sensations. Yes, you know, and it, it's it's that self empowerment and that and you know what I love is that you also get um, a little in touch with a little bit of pain, but not much because it goes right away. And if you breathe with it, it does. And as you get that experience, it it it, it because when you've been in pain for a long time um, and your nervous system, the sympathetics are really rocking and rolling it's hard not to try to keep withdrawing and making your world smaller and smaller. And unfortunately that never works. You know, I mean, it, it's in the go on about, and we found that out in other things, you know, concussions, they've shown that, you know, rest is not what you, I mean, you know, you don't want to go back into the sport, but you don't want to just lie in bed and not move. That will not heal anything. And because again, your nervous system will get more and more upregulated. So let's go to questions because we could, you and I can chat all day about this. I'm and, sure. <laughs> uh, here, Darcy's letting me know that we have questions because I can't see them. So, all right. I, I'm hoping you can hear me. I have a slightly yep. bad connection, but. Uh, we um, hear you well. Okay, great. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, can you cover any findings or theories about fascia and long COVID? <laughs> findings? Theories I have plenty. <laughs> you know? um, and it, it's, it's long COVID is just chronic, I mean, not just, but it is chronic inflammation. Um, and unfortunately, we don't know, is it because the bug is still there? Is it because the spike protein is still there? Is it because you have a, a, you know, a, coag a hypercoagulability? Um, it, do you have a, a, you know, autoimmunity? Um, and a, three other things, which I can't remember off the top of my head. But so there's lots of possibilities. But at the end of the day, you have chronic inflammation. And when you have chronic inflammation, that means that parts of your body are going to tighten up where those local areas are. And so opening up that fascia as best you can will help those areas heal um, because you probably got one of the, we don't know why you get long COVID, but um, having a part, having low level inflammation beforehand seems to be a very, very high risk. Okay. Cause that's why, you know, it, it, that seems to be almost required is, you know, except probably a few people with some rare genetic things, but almost everybody who has long COVID had low level persistent inflammation that they just didn't notice because we're busy and it didn't hurt too much. So um, it gets stuck in that connective tissue and that's fascia. And so that is my connection. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, and that's perfect. I mean, totally agree because again, it really comes, we've got so many people uh, in my community group that have shared their stories through this process and when they get on the block they can move things so much faster out of the body because yes we are all in this state I mean we're so toxic today so we, we all have this low level inflammation going on and then yeah when you have something like that attack you it, your body just doesn't have the capacity to heal fully because we're already exhausted so depending on, and that's why not everybody's going to get it. Some people, you know, have the resiliency to heal more effectively from something and others don't. So by opening up the lymphatics and allowing everything to move out of the body through that full exhalation and feed those cells beautifully, then we can definitely improve the rate of detoxification, which I think is the most important thing, getting that liver going and, and really cleaned out of all those fats as well, which this process helps with fatty liver as well. Yeah. And, and so just, but I don't want to belabor the point, but I think the data on fascia and long COVID, I don't know if anybody has any, I mean, that, that's the thing is that this is not an area. I mean, there's, there are a few researchers now here and there all over the world, mostly in Europe that are really have a deep interest in fascia, you know, from the science, from the quote unquote, you know, scientific medical point of view, but it, it, it has been long ignored because um, orthopedics cares about bones. 
you know, and we can't, and up until MRI, even with MRIs, you really don't see fascia well, you know, you can see it, but not great. Um, uh, so in medicine, we can't see it. We don't care about it, <laughs> unfortunately, um, even though it's probably critical. So we should move on to another question. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I have a teenager with very cold hands and feet. What could be the cause in your experience? You want me to jump into that? Yeah, one? I'll let you. Yeah, you, the people are here to hear you today. I, I can <laughs> I hear me all the time. <laughs> so as soon as we don't have that conscious breath and conscious alignment, we end up falling in and the body twists and adheres. And as soon as it does that, again, we're creating adhesions and blocking flow to the channels of blood down to the extremities and the calves and the feet and the forearms and the hands. Again, they're the furthest from the engine. So they're going to be the areas of the body that the fascia will become most manipulated. Just as an example, if you see most people walking around, they have their palms facing behind them. Anatomical position is actually palms facing forward. And if we're correctly aligned, we have all these channels for flow open, but that's not our reality because again, we're all pulled forward and we're on computers or the phone and we've literally internally rotated this area and we've compressed. So these channels of flow into the arms and the hands, and the legs um, through, again, just shifting our alignment over time and the adhesions that develop block that flow. And then you're going to have cold extremities. Yeah. You know, and if you go to your doctor, they'll tell you you're the same thing, but with it from a different perspective that it's affecting the nerves and the, and the, and the blood flow. And well, it is because the nerves and blood flow go through the fascia. So when that connective tissue is tight, um, that's what's going to happen, except we don't have pills for fascia <laughs> and we can open up blood flow with pills, but we don't do that very often just for cold hands and cold feet. But that's basically how the system works. And if you go back to the, the fascia, you can get those nerves and blood vessels to actually function better. Okay. Now, have you ever, ex uh, do you have any experience with someone who's had connective tissue disorder? I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Any insights about the fascia and EDS? Yes, I actually deal a lot with people with Ehlers-Danlos. And what I've really come to understand, everything in the body is either, it, well, it's out of balance. And for the people that I see with connective tissue disorder, they are so incredibly locked. So their diaphragm is truly locked away and it's created this laxity in the limbs because of a disintegration from that lack of flow. The diaphragm is the connector. It's the driver of the energy and the fluid. So when those cells aren't getting that energy for life, they start to wear down and wear away. And through the process of this, we have seen many of our community members really make huge gains in their connective tissue disorders and bring balance back into their body. And as soon as that flow, again, starts to move through the body, then integration of cells happen and those cell walls, they start to become nice and strong again. When we don't have that flow, the cell walls become again, squished and dirty. And again, they're not really allowing much absorption or detoxification. So opening up that breath is the key and then working through the program because it's, it's again, it's a full body program. Fascia connects everything together. So we need to look at the whole body, but we, we definitely see a lot of that in our community and positive changes as a result. Yeah, I would throw in is that when people have, I mean, we see, a, I mean, connective tissue disorders, it should be, is now our middle name because the, there's very prone to chronic inflammation. Um, and so much, I love what Diana is, is talking about because it's easy just to see people locked up and think, oh, you know, they're just protecting themselves, you know, because, but it's that early, you know, people with connective tissue tend to have a little lax ligaments. And so they make great yogis and, um, you know, and they wind up, um, then they get too loose for a while and then the muscles tighten up. And then again, there's no flow and that poor fascia and your diaphragm is restricted. So it's always, I just love the circles, okay? Like, you know, you look at it, I'm not pointing to Deanna, she's looking at it, you know, from the foundation. And as a doctor, I'm always looking at it from, oh my God, this is where it kind of fell at the end, you know? But at the beginning, 
it is the body, the connective tissue that really is the beginning. So it's interesting, you know, people get tight for lots of different reasons, but if you can open the, the diaphragm, if you can let all the chest actually have its normal relationship to the body and the shoulders, uh, lots of things that are worse because they're not getting good blood flow will improve. And that includes your connective tissue because anyways, I don't want to, I have to stop myself. All these things always make me want to go on and on. So I'm going to shut up. Next question. <laughs> My gosh, no problem. Um, questions about scoliosis. Can someone who has scoliosis use your program? Mm, yes. I think scoliosis is one of the most common things that I address, especially with kids today. And again, it's, it, it's so fascinating because it comes down to understanding how the limbs impact the core. So whenever I'm looking at a body, I always first look at what's going on in the foundation because the calves and the feet are the furthest away from the rest of the body. And even if you had a frozen shoulder, say, and you went and you had your shoulder worked on, as soon as you start walking, you're going to get pulled into the pattern of the lower body. And that's going to be a large driver for what's happening in the shoulder even. So scoliosis, same thing. It's not only a function of what's going on in the spine. It's, it's what's happening in the limbs and how they're all becoming twisted. So whenever I look at a body, I always look at what side is the flat tire? There's always going to be one foot that's drawing further away from the body. It tends into pronation, more external rotation. It's further away from midline. Because again, the fascia is here to keep us upright. Unconsciously, we anchor that opposite side. So if I had, if these were my feet and these were my hip joints and I was properly aligned, this is where things would be positioned. But as I start pulling away, this is what's happening over time. So we're getting this shifting in the core as a result of what's going on in the limbs. So when we address the limbs as well as the body and teach people also how to release the pattern that they're currently in and then rebuild from that foundation up with proper postural understanding and exercise, then we can pull the body back to its balance point so that we can really correct what's going on. And I have a beautiful example of a six-year-old, um, fascinating little boy. He's, I think, eight now, and he's just an amazing blocker but when he was six he picked up the bow and arrow um, and just loved it they live in the country in Ontario and he picked up this bow and arrow and for hours a day his parents told me he was always slinging his body in one direction so then six months later now he's got this crazy scoliosis so when I first got on the call with them I said okay well you know what wh when did you notice this and and this was the discussion so he was blocking but I also said what he needs to do now is practice the other side so he can start pulling his body back to that balance point and we've got pictures of him and we have an interview with him and his parents actually because he was able to prevent surgeries they wanted to um, fuse his spine have him in a brace for multiple hours a day and he's hanging he's playing he's a strong little kid and he's he's kind of one of our stars in our community because he's just so amazing and and he's yeah he's changed his game and the cool part, it's going to work really well with six-year-olds, but it can work with 60-year-olds if, you know, yes. you're not going to go back to normal, but you can improve, you can get less pain in how, if if the scoliosis is, is causing pain or restriction, you can, it will get better, you know, I mean, and that's what we're looking for, because if, you know, we're lucky, we don't need perfection in this, in this body of ours you know we, we get away with with close enough on a million million levels i mean <laughs> so it's just better is usually good agree <laughs> all right i'm skimming through these questions and seeing if there are some themes we can go go at because we only have a few minutes here there have been a few questions about surgeries and how soon after surgery can you start this process and other questions where can you can you use your process to help with scarring after surgeries well and that that's thank you that's a super question and what's so nice about this so depending on of course where the surgery was and what it was for let's say it's the lower abdomen you can always start in that rib cage area and improve your breath we can work from a distance to where the actual issue is 
getting that breath going, knee replacements, hip replacements. This is all stuff that we can still really get that breath strong because once we get the breath stronger, we can become our own healing machine. So even, even just lying on your back and teaching yourself how to diaphragmatically breathe. When you're lying on your back, your belly should get big with the inhale and small with the exhale. Most people have it the other way around. So simply training this action is going to start making changes. But then we have lots of different approaches where we can use our hands first before we go into this space and work around the scar site. And again, it comes down to your breath is your guide. So we don't want to be really aggressive with the body. And this isn't an aggressive process. It's persuasion versus force. So every body, in my view, will be different in when is it appropriate to proceed. But that's why we have a community group and we have people directly connected to us so they can ask questions along the way and we can create modifications if needed if that's the situation I'm, I'm emailed all the time from people having surgeries so it really is a unique situation to each and every person and it's based on how you're healing and what the actual surgery was but we can absolutely get that body healing at a more rapid pace by simply just engaging the breath to begin with all right um there's a few broken bone questions um hands feet um the <laughs> a lot of broken bones um specifically here barbara asked where would i begin when i have three broken bones in my foot still in a cast but when i start weight bearing i want to be on top of continued healing so broken hands broken feet share something <laughs> well that's 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 easy oh sorry did dr eric no no eric? no i want you on this one okay I, okay me. um it when they're the extremities you can start that breath work right away and it's fascinating i have a couple of videos on my youtube channel so i have a very different approach to dealing with fractures the second law of thermodynamics is nature abhors a gradient which means when there's a gap in the system nature's going to fill it in so whether we're talking about a tear in a tendon ligament muscle or a fracture in a bone, they're all gaps in the system. So the body's natural response is to go and send inflammation directed blood flow to actually rebuild the tissue that's been damaged. We need to support that process, support that inflammatory process. The process of rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, where as an athletic therapist, I was trained for the first 48 to 72 hours to stop that inflammation or limit that inflammation. In my view, that's not the correct approach because now we're actually slowing down the body's natural response to stress or injury. And we're still left with this gradient. So the body is going to fill it in with scar tissue. So all the tissue in the surrounding area to where that gap is, like a vortex, the fascia gets sucked in but it's not sucking in life. It's basically squeezing the life out. Now you're getting just the netting, which creates the scar tissue. So now we end up shifted or changed. So from the perspective of a fracture, I have, I'm just going to share this story because this is, this was my first one where I was dealing with a fracture differently. And it was so amazing. So it was an 18 year old. He was a rugby player and he had a really severe fourth metatarsal fracture. I saw him on day six after his injury, he was supposed to be playing rugby his final game and he was the captain three weeks from the time of his injury and he was told not to wait bear for four weeks so he came in day six i treated him four times he played in three weeks with no pain and you can see that story on our website we've got the videos and then that prompted an 18 year old soccer player who came who had a jones fracture the fifth metatarsal and he arrived at my doorstep three weeks in wearing a boot told not to wait or, or not to get out of that boot for six weeks and that he might even need to have a rod put into that bone by day two after he was there he was bounding on both feet with no pain and in fact it was quite comical because he didn't bring a, a shoe because he'd been in that boot for three weeks so only had, he only had the shoe on the one foot so he had to go to the mall and buy like a pair of shoes the day after because he didn't need the boot anymore so when we approach the inflammation through a different way we can rebuild that gap. It's like if you're baking a cake, you've got all of these raw ingredients and you create batter. If you put batter in the freezer, you have frozen batter. If you put it in the oven, you bake cake. So we need to add energy to the body through the process of breathing, through fascia decompression down toward the site so that the body can pull away the damage, the debris. Like any injury is like a car accident. You're going to have damage and debris. So we want to pull that out of the way so that we've got the space for the 
oxygen and whatever else is necessary to rebuild to happen. And when we do that, we are incredibly efficient healers. Yeah. And I just want to reinforce that it is we medicine treats everything um, with the idea that we want to prevent damage and we make damage because we don't understand healing. Healing does require inflammation. Inflammation isn't bad. It's what will heal you in the first few days. If you let it go on forever and ever, well, then that's not good. But it's not you letting it. It goes on forever and ever because you interrupt it. And taking a ton of non-steroidals is a great way to interrupt that healing process when you first get injured. But it's what we tell patients to do all the time. You go to the, you know, they send you home with the boot and Motrin or something, you know, which is just the wrong thing to do. And, and it's, and that, and that not movement is what creates the, the stasis, the lack of flow to the area. And you, so I love what you're saying. It's, but the thing is, you got to do this with some thought and with someone who knows what they're doing, because you can't hurt yourself. No, you don't want to go run when you, um, you know, you know, broke your, 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 your tibia or, or your fibula the next day. That's not a good idea, but you don't want to put it up and rest it forever either. So anyway, long other discussions, um, but just basically remember that uh, healing requires inflammation. You just don't, you just want to make sure that you have enough life in you so you don't get that stagnation and a lot of swelling. All right, one last question to wrap up because there are some questions about how is this um, different than say using a, a ball or a roller or a myofascial release or a lymphatic massage? I know there's a lot in there, Deanna, but if you could like talk to that and then we will wrap up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and great question. So when we're, when we're working on the surface, we're staying on the surface and we'll improve circulation to those surface layers, but the root of the problem is at the bone. So we need to be able to drive through the layers of fascia and through this process, we don't move on the surface. It's like the difference between being on a boat on the ocean compared to deep sea diving. We're going deep sea diving through the layers of fascia, through the process of melting and continuing to explore with the breath through the layers. So it, it's also understanding really how to engage that breath because without the breath, if you're doing other work and you're not properly breathing, again, we're not really getting the benefits because we need to turn on that internal furnace. So the whole system itself takes a different approach and we're literally taking a frozen body and we're turning it into a warmer body. We're taking something that was ice and we're turning it into liquid. We aren't parts. We are this beautiful fluid matrix and yet we, we can see the parts in us, but all parts are interconnected through this beautiful fluid fascia. But when we don't have proper flow, we literally become frozen. I live on the 13th floor, right over the top of a river, and I live in Winnipeg. So for 15 years now, I've watched the river freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. And it's amazing because everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. And I've learned so much from observing the patterns of nature and what happens during these different temperatures and, and all of these other things. So we're literally through this process, taking this frozen tissue and we're liquefying it. And then it becomes integrated and healthy as opposed to frozen and brittle where it can break very simply. So um, I hope that explained the difference, Darcy. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we can make that a whole webinar because they're all subtly different. And yeah. you know, the beauty is your process is kind of using, is letting the body experience almost all of those in, in, in its own way and its own time. All right, that's it. Thank you, Deanna. I really appreciate having you on and uh, also um, getting a chance to use your, your blocks because oh. they are something. They really thank do. Thank you so much, thank Eric. You. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, thank you all for showing up today and uh, taking the time to listen. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you all. And we'll do more on um, the body because I think the body, the phys our physical being is at really is what's going to lead us to back to health. So take care, everyone. Bye-bye.